Hello class uh, and welcome to the lecture on uh, secure inefficient uh, secure and uh, efficient in process isolation with memory protection keys. Uh, let me just go to full screen and then we will start. All right. So thus far in the course, we have uh, studied memory uh, errors and ways and means by which we can detect or defend against these kinds of errors as well as the corresponding exploits. In this lecture, as well as in the uh, subsequent two or three lectures, we will be taking a slightly different approach to the same problems where we instead look at the problem of isolation. So isolation is a, is a, is a security methodology or a, secu or, a, or a way of thinking about security where we assume that the attack has happened or that attacks can happen and that we are working with vulnerable software and uh, the isolation methodology attempts to at least limit the effects of what this, um, this compromised code can do. So it's a different way of thinking about security. Uh, and uh, the goal, the primary goal over here is to try to limit or contain the effects of an exploit. To that end, uh, we are going to be studying today uh, a paper called uh, ERIM. ERIM is based upon a new hardware technology called Intel MPK or memory protection keys that has now been available for approximately one and a half to two years. Uh, I will give you more details. So what you're studying in this lecture is rather cutting edge. And uh, we will be looking at one particular paper that builds upon Intel MPK. We will see that Intel MPK offers certain primitives, certain new hardware primitives, but that more work is needed to build a complete security solution using uh, uh, the, the features of the MPK. And that is what ERIM is. So ERIM was published in Usenix Security 2019, where it was awarded the uh, best paper. And so we will be looking at that. It's by a team from the Max Planck Institute in Saarbrücken in Germany. Okay, so let's look at a motivating application, uh, which is that supposing you were to consider an application such as the one that is shown in the slide, this may be some sort of a server application or a desktop application. Uh, as you can see, this application is storing some sensitive data represented by this key. Maybe it's a cryptographic key. You can imagine, for example, your web browser stores a cryptographic key associated with every SSL session that is currently active in the browser. And things like browsers and servers are written in low level languages like C, C++, so bugs may be lurking in them. Uh, and security vulnerabilities may be lurking in them. The problem is that if this bug gets exploited, uh, the corresponding exploit will have the privileges of the entire application, as a result of which the attacker will be able to get access to everything in the application's address space, including the sensitive key, okay? So this is a bad situation, and the situation happens because there is no isolation of this important piece of security data from the rest of the application, which may potentially be buggy. Uh, so you can see the real world impact of that. So for example, the heartbleed bug is the most recent high profile um, um, instance of a memory error. It is not a buffer overflow, but rather a buffer overread problem in the very popular OpenSSL library. This happened in around 2014. And every application that uses the OpenSSL library to provide secure sockets uh, suffered from problems because of the hard bleed bug. So anybody, so for example, if this application was using or linking against the OpenSSL library, the bug that was within the OpenSSL library was, uh, could be used to compromise the entire application, including any secrets that were stored within the application. And as you can see, you know, um, the CVEs or common vulnerabilities and exposures, this is a way of, uh, 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 this is a way of indexing known software vulnerabilities. Uh, according to Microsoft, nearly 70% of the CVEs that are assigned 
our uh, memory safety issues. So this is a big problem and we would like to try to um, better protect against this. Of course, you know, the solutions that we have studied uh, in class, things like control flow integrity, soft bounds, stack canaries and so on, these are all defenses. Um, but as you well know, they come with various assumptions. They might not be readily applicable. And even if they are applicable, for example, in the case of CFI, the policy may not be uh, perfectly designed, thereby allowing the attacker some wiggle room uh, to go and exploit the program. So we would like to develop lightweight isolation techniques. Okay, so here are some examples of what I mean by isolation. And the goal here is to implement in-process isolation. So we will assume that your server, your browser, or whatever it is, is started as a user process on the machine. And we want to identify segments or portions within this process that are isolated from the rest of the process. We are going to revisit this concept later on in this course, this notion of in-process isolation when we talk about software guard extensions and cloud computing much later in the course. But this is one instance of this notion of in-process isolation. So in the first application, uh, in the first sort of example, uh, let us say that you have a trusted cryptographic library uh, such as embed TLS that you're using with your application to manage cryptographic keys. This application may, for instance, be your web browser. It is untrusted because it is written in C, C++ code and may contain low level vulnerabilities, uh, memory vulnerabilities. Now, the problem is that this untrusted application has to link against the cryptographic library. And anytime the untrusted application is, is compromised, even the, uh, uh, the contents of the crypto library are, are going to be revealed to the attacker. So our goal is to build a picture as shown on this slide, where you want to separate out the two, the untrusted portion of the application and the trusted cryptographic library, so that the trusted crypto library shown in green is protected with this dark green boundary, so that anytime the, app, the untrusted application wants to enter the trusted crypto library and access these keys, it happens through well-known interfaces. Okay, and that even if the untrusted application gets attacked by this attacker, or the attacker is able to uh, exploit a vulnerability in this untrusted application that the attacker does not get his hands on the keys that are stored within the trusted crypto library. So that's one use case. Here's a second use case, which is manage runtimes from native libraries. So there are a number of popular languages nowadays, for example, Python, Node.js, and so on that use managed runtimes. So when I say managed runtimes, I mean things like interpreters uh, that run the programs for you. <clears throat> now, even these interpreters <coughs> accept what are called native libraries. So, for example, you can always extend the functionality of the Python interpreter with some C native libraries that you can download into the Python uh, uh, interpreter and then they run as extensions. So, they can also expose interfaces that can be invoked from the Python programs. So, here the managed runtime is that of the Python interpreter. And the native library is something that you download to provide some additional functionality, okay? And so the native library may be untrusted, it may have bugs, and even if it does have bugs, you want to protect it, uh, you want to protect the manage runtime from any exploits against this native library. So you want to make the manage runtime a isolated part of the process that runs the, the Python program. So these are some example use cases. There are many others, <coughs> but uh, um, we will not be going over all of the other examples. We will look at them later on in the course, uh, but the typical prototypical example is that you have got some secret data within a process and you want to make sure that that secret data is protected no matter what happens to the rest of the process. Okay. Um, okay. So, that brings us to our threat model. We are going to be working completely in user space, right? So sitting, so this picture over here shows the threat, the, the, the threat model where everything shown in orange is untrusted. When I say untrusted, it means that it is potentially controlled by the attacker, either because it's a malicious program or because it has vulnerabilities that can be exploited by the attacker, therefore making the program uh, untrusted. Now within this untrusted application, we have a trusted compartment which stores all of our data that we want to, uh, that, that is critical, that we consider critical, okay? 
Now, for this work, we are going to be working completely in user space. There is going to be no involvement of the operating system or the CPU. And so the operating system and the CPU are going to be considered to be trusted portions of our TCB, of our trusted computing base. Now, later on in the course, we will see that there are ways and means by which to create such green trusted compartments within untrusted applications where even the operating system is untrusted. That is SGX. Okay, but that comes later in the course and the usage scenarios are different. The usage scenario there is that of cloud computing where the operating system is actually being run by an untrusted third party cloud provider like Amazon or Microsoft and yet you want to protect your applications. So today it's not like that. Today we are going to be studying a user space threat model where the application code is untrusted. You want to build a trusted compartment inside this untrusted application with the operating system and the CPU being trusted. So we will assume that our attacker is very powerful and the attacker is capable of performing control flow hijacking attacks within this untrusted application. The attacker can perform memory corruption or out of bounds access within this untrusted application, but that they should not be trust, they should still not be able to access the trusted compartment. Now, there are certain things that we are going to be considering out of scope. Uh, these might not, these terms might not make much sense to you right now, but they will once we start talking about Spectre and Meltdown later in the course. These are real threats and these are called side channel attacks whereby the attacker uses micro architectural features such as cache timing and so on to identify secrets in the application. So row hammer is another such example where you keep writing to memory and you try to flip a bit. So we are going to exclude such microarchitectural attacks or attacks are purely software-based attacks and we want to be able to build this trusted compartment. That is the goal of today's lecture. Okay, so let's look at the state of the art uh, in terms of what exists to create such isolation techniques. So there are three broad classes of techniques. The first one is operating system or virtual machine based techniques where you know, there is an operating system or a virtual machine and then an application executes on top of it and you create another partition that is managed by the operating system or the virtual machine that manages the sensitive data. So if it was an operating system, for instance, the application and the sensitive data can run as different processes and communicate with each other via uh, inter-process communication or shared memory. Okay. Likewise, if it's a virtual machine monitor, the application as well as the sensitive data can execute inside different virtual machines. So here, the operating system and the virtual machine monitor using the features provided by hardware are able to provide isolation. What is this hardware feature they are using to provide isolation? Hardware feature is virtual memory, right? Using virtual memory, you are able to isolate the memory views of one application from the memory views of another application. Now, the execution overhead is of course low for both trusted as well as untrusted because it's like executing a virtual machine or a process. The problem is that the overhead to switch between the application and the sensitive data portion is rather high. And the reason is because in this particular picture, every time the application wants to talk uh, and obtain some sensitive data from this uh, green box over here, it has to do an inter-process communication, which is several thousands or tens of thousands of cycles because it goes through a system call, comes here and then fetches it back. Okay, so that is not acceptable for applications that frequently want to access this sensitive data. Okay, so that's what is shown over here as medium. Now here is another way to isolate, which is using language and runtime techniques. Uh, for example, software fault isolation, you know, uh, in CFI, we saw this notion of SMAC and so on, which essentially created such zones within the application where sensitive data was isolated. If you remember CFI and uh, if you remember software fault isolation, SFI and SMAC, their goal was precisely this, to keep uh, a portion of the application um, isolated from the rest of the application. Now, the problem here is that the switch overhead between the trusted and the untrusted portions is rather low, right? Because it just involves executing a few assembly instructions, but you're actually going to pay a rather amount, high, uh, 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 high overhead for the execution of the rest of the application. And this is the overhead that you see when you run CFI or SFI, right? Uh, and so 
the untrusted code constitutes the largest fraction of the application. And so you don't want to have to pay that additional performance cost every time you're executing the untrusted portion. So what we are going to introduce today is this third point in the design space where the cost of executing the untrusted code is low, the cost of executing trusted code is low, and the switch overhead between the application and the sensitive data compartment is very low, okay? And it's going to essentially mirror this where the sensitive data compartment is sitting over here. Every time the application wants to access the sensitive data, it goes through this layer called ERIM, which then shepherds the access to the sensitive data and provides it to the application, okay? And the key thing, the key design factor that we are going to optimize for is the performance overhead of switching between the untrusted and the trusted portions. Okay, this is by no means the only way of doing this, right? There have been a large body of other work over here that you can see on the slide, as well as follow from the paper that do similar things. However, MPK represents the state of the art as well as the lowest performance overhead that we know of to date, as well as novel hardware support to provide this kind of isolation. So that's why we are studying MPK. Although it is by no means the only way to accomplish this same goal. Okay, so let me now tell you about MPK. Uh, MPK stands for Memory Protection Keys. Uh, it is an Intel technology. So uh, it is now available in Intel Skylake server CPUs. It has also recently become available in desktop CPUs. I believe the Xeon range. Um, so memory protection keys is widely available. If you buy an Intel CPU, it is there. The instructions that use it are there. It's just a matter of writing applications that use that instruction set architecture. Okay, so what is the main concept behind MPK? Well, as you all know, every process is organized into a virtual address space where you have virtual pages, right? Page one, page two, page three, so on, okay? The size of the address space depends upon the architecture, right? Either you have uh, address space of four gigabytes on 32-bit machine or an address space of, of size two power 48, typically on a 64-bit machine, okay? Now, the way that you translate between virtual pages and physical pages, as you well know, is using a page table, right? And the page table has individual entries for how virtual pages translate to physical memory addresses. Now, the idea behind memory protection keys is that you're going to associate or group together the pages of your address space, the virtual pages of your address space by assigning them a special tag called a P key, okay? Or a protection key. So the protection key uh, as we will see in the next slide, the protection key is a four bit value. And so you can group together your pages in the virtual address space of your program into 16 different categories, okay? Um, it all depends upon the number of bits. Currently it's four bits. And so four bits allows you to group together your uh, virtual pages into 16 different categories, okay? So that's what this is, right? You can tag your memory pages uh, using um, this uh, uh, um, uh, this P key. And that is, it corresponds to big 62 to 59 in the page table. Okay, so every page is tagged uh, and the value of the tag can range anywhere from between zero to 15, okay? Now, the tag does not do anything by itself, right? All the tag or this P key does is that it groups together the pages, right? If you look at a page and you look at the page table entry for that page, you will know which group it corresponds to. Now, the, the place that security is actually enforced is using what is called this permission register or PKRU. I'll be referring to this permission register PKRU quite often in this lecture. Now, the PKRU register is a 32-bit register. Okay, so uh, in the Intel MPK, each one of these groups of pages is called a domain, right? So you have 16 domains from zero to 15. And essentially what MPK does is that it assigns within this PKRU register a two bit value for every domain, okay? So um, here is the, uh, so there are, there are 
16 such domains because the PKRU register is 32 bits. Each domain has two bits. And so um, you have uh, 16 such domains. Each domain has uh, uh, two bits, okay? So the bits represent whether you can read a page and write a page. That's what these bits are. So if they're set to zero, you cannot, zero, zero, you cannot read or write the page. Zero, one, you cannot read the page, but write to the page. One, zero, you can read the page, but cannot write to it. And one, one, you can both read and write to it, okay? The important thing about the PKRU register is that it's accessible via user space. You can go and update the PKRU register completely from user space. Now, those of you that are familiar with the mProtect system call uh, on Unix systems might ask, you know, how is this different from mProtect? Using mProtect, I can also set read, write, execute permissions for individual pages. And not only that, I do not have to do it at this granularity of domains. I can do it at the granularity of individual pages, right? So why is MPK such a big deal? You know, what is it that MPK is buying me that mProtect cannot give me? And the answer to that question is that every time you do an mProtect, you're actually doing a system call, which means that you have to do a user to kernel switch, which costs several hundred processor cycles. In contrast, changing the domain register, the PKRU register is completely done in user space. It's a matter of writing to a register. So it takes only a few tens of cycles, okay? So it provides fast switching or it provides fast protection without having to do any sort of context switch, okay? Now, this last sentence over here by itself, it protects against bugs only, will become clear in just a second. Um, uh, and, you know, you might ask me, you know, look, there is this PKRU register, it's providing me some sort of protection and permission assignment to pages, but what good is it if, uh, you know, this permission can be uh, modified completely from user space, especially if it is modified by, let's say, uh, code that the attacker controls or uh, an attacker injects code so as to be able to go and modify the uh, PKRU register. And these are all good questions. I will be answering those. Okay. So as I was mentioning, uh, the Intel memory protection keys uh, architecture tags each uh, memory page with a P key and uh, the permission uh, the PKRU register or the permission register stores the two bit value corresponding to each page. So for example, in this picture, you can see that page one is part of domain number two and the permissions corresponding to domain number two are zero and zero for write and read. Okay, so that means that you cannot read or write that page. Um, page two and page three are part of this other domain, the default domain, if you will, uh, which is domain number zero. If you don't assign anything, it's domain number zero and both write as well as a, a, a read permissions are there for those pages, okay? So the idea is that you can update the P, P, uh, PKRU and I'll tell you the instructions to update the PKRU. Uh, it takes between uh, 11 to 260 processor cycles, right? Which is a few nanoseconds worth of, uh, of uh, wall clock execution time. So that's the major advantage as opposed to thousands or tens of thousands of cycles for things like system calls where you have to do a protection domain switch. All right, so by itself, uh, the MPK does not protect against malicious attacks. And what I mean by this is that uh, there is nothing in what I have told you so far that prevents malicious code from going and changing this PKRU register and therefore the permissions that are assigned to a page. So if a page is not readable or writable, there is nothing in what I've told you so far that prevents malicious code from going and writing to the PKRU register and providing the values um, uh, one and one to the corresponding page that it wants to read and write from, and then proceed to read the page, okay? Give permission and then read the page. So the rest of this, presentation and the rest of this paper talks about the ERIM system that actually provides protection against such malicious code from acting, okay? Okay, so we are going to be isolating sensitive state. So our goal is to create a picture of this sort where let's say we have got two domains, right? You can create 
up to 16 domains, but let's start simple. And let us say that we want to create two domains, an untrusted domain where all of the untrusted code of the application runs together with its application state. And we want to create a trusted partition of the application. For example, you know, in a crypto library, it might be the partition that stores the keys and directly manipulates the keys or generates keys, for example. So that stuff is going to be here within this trusted portion, the green portion. Okay, so we will start simple. We are only interested in two domains. Uh, the concept generalizes to uh, as many domains as you want, but we will start with this. Okay, so we are only be going to be concerned with D0 and D1. And the idea is that when, um, you know, D0 is executing uh, uh, with read and write permissions one and one, D0, this domain zero, the untrusted domain will not be able to read or write the trusted domain, right? So the permission bits will be set to zero. Now you might ask me, you know, what prevents malicious code over here from injected code, for example, using a buffer overflow to go and change this value over here to a one and a one, right? And that's certainly possible, right? Uh, and you can prevent that using things like WX or X. And so those are additional precautions that we take over and above domain keys. But note that WX or X does not give you things like uh, a trusted, uh, 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 you know, a partition within an application. So we will build on top of WX or X, of course. Okay, so this domain switch, uh, as I said, you know, if you want to go from domain one to domain, uh, if you want to work in domain one, you need to give read and write permissions. And the way you would do that is by actually writing to this, but you don't want any code to be able to do this. If you let any code do it, then even you know, attacker code can change the, the domain protections and then enter the trusted location and start doing bad things, right? So it's efficient, but it's vulnerable to attack. And so that's what the meaning of what I said in the previous slide is. And so we are now going to see how ERIM prevents against that, right? So the way that ERIM is going to work is that it's roughly going to be like this, right? So supposing we have got, um, you know, uh, a function A, right? Uh, and you have got some sensitive data to uh, go and, uh, and access, the way that we are going to do is that you're going to uh, um, switch to the trusted mode, right? And then access the sensitive data and then switch back to the untrusted portion. Okay, so within a function, you've got this, in some sense, the portion of the function that is accessing the sensitive data and you switch and then you switch out, okay? And the, these switches are going to be called call gates as we will see right now, okay? So the call gates are the ones that we are now going to see how to implement, okay? Um, so that's how ERIM roughly works. The code of uh, the application must be written in this way with a switch trusted and the switch untrusted. You can ignore this portion of the slide for now, the right-hand side, okay? So let's see how it works. Okay, so what is a call gate? So a call gate is something uh, uh, that works as, as, uh, as follows. Okay, so let's say that there is a trusted partition within the code that's shown over here in this commented area. What you do is that you invoke this instruction called WRPKRU, which is writing to PKRU. That's the instruction that you use to go and change the PKRU. We'll see much more about it. And what you do is you provide read write permissions to the trusted partition. So what you do is uh, to begin with, as I said, you know, we are only interested in trusted and untrusted. So you take the uh, you 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 put your trusted code on certain pages. You put the untrusted code on the remaining pages, and uh, you uh, uh, ensure that you provide the uh, read write permissions to these trusted pages at the point when you are entering, uh, and uh, that's what this RW trusted is. It's the action of going and setting read and write permissions on the uh, 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 on the domains corresponding to the trusted pages. So you do that, you enter the trusted zone, and then you know you compare, uh, you do WRPKR, you distrust it, which is you revoke the permissions, then you check whatever you get against EAX, right? Uh, and uh, you, know, you, uh, you check that the permissions are reduced and then continue. Otherwise, you know, if this distrusted does not match what is in EAX in the sense of, you know, it doesn't match the fact that, you know, you're reduced the permissions, 
you're going to exit and continue. Roughly speaking, this is how a call gate works. We'll now see how it works uh, in more detail. So this is how you would rewrite at the C level of abstraction, right? So here is a program that is, for example, uh, initializing a secret. Uh, and uh, here is the place where you're computing some sort of a, uh, uh, something with the secret. So the secret is being passed and then you're computing something. You switch to the ERIM switch T is basically the code that is going to change the permissions of the pages. It's going to, uh, uh, and this stuff over here executes within the trusted portion, okay? And the same thing over here, the stuff over here that's generating the random number, you want the random number to be secret, and therefore you're switching to the trusted domain, you run all of this there, and then you switch back out into the untrusted domain. Okay, so that's how roughly the programmer has to do some work, right, which is that of inserting these macros over here, ERIM switch T and ERIM switch U. Um, so what are ERIM switch T and ERIM switch U? Well, they're actually assembly language uh, sequences that go and change the PKRU register. Roughly in the form that's shown over here, the paper contains the full sequence of code of exactly how you go and change the uh, PKRU register. In fact, we can go and look at that uh, in uh, uh, just a second. Uh, Let me just show you where that appears. So the paper, the paper contains the actual sequence, the assembly language sequence to go and perform the PKRU right here, okay? So this is how you, this is the entry gate, right? So to do something with the ECX and the EDX registers, which is zero them out. The value of EAX is called, uh, value of PKRU allowed trusted, which is a macro that represents the fact that, you know, the uh, the trusted domain is now your good allow read write permissions is copied into, e, into EAX and WRPKRU is nothing but a macro. It's an instruction that copies the contents of EAX into PKRU. You can then execute the trusted code. And then once you execute the trusted code, you want to go back to the uh, untrusted portion. So you revoke the permissions uh, to the trusted code, the trusted pages, that's what this macro PKRU disallowed trusted says. Basically, it will contain the 32-bit pattern that does not contain read and write permissions for the trusted pages. Copy that to EAX and do a WP, uh, uh, WR PKRU, right? So what that does is that it copies the value of EAX into PKRU, and then you want to check at this point that, in fact, you have copied, and then you then proceed, okay? So that's roughly how things proceed. Uh, with respect to the call gates as well as the exit gates. Okay, so uh, let's move forward. So here's an overview of ERIM, right? So I'm going to now present to you how these call gates work, right? And the call gates allow you to enter the trusted components. So that's what is shown as a gate over here. You have this code and the code is the untrusted code. Within that, you have a trusted compartment. You enter the trusted compartment using the call gates, okay? Um, and you want to do binary inspection, I'll tell you why, okay? Uh, and uh, I will now show you how, okay, so before we go there, right, uh, this WRPKRU is just one of the ways in which you can, uh, 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 you know, modify the PKRU register. The hexadecimal sequence corresponding to WRPKRU is EF010F. And you want to make sure that that instruction only appears in the call gate portion, okay? That it does not appear anywhere else in the program. If it does appear anywhere else in the program, then the attacker can use that, okay? In fact, the analogy over here would be to think in terms of uh, what we studied for return-oriented programming, right? So if you went to return-oriented programming, the idea was that you exploited gadgets that appeared anywhere in the program. Exactly in the same way, if you have this WRPKRU uh, uh, instruction sequence appearing anywhere else in the program, the attacker can go and misuse that to go and enter the trusted compartment, right? So we want to make sure that the only occurrences of this WRPKRU instruction are in the code that we write and we provide. We means the ERM system provides as part of uh, the call gate uh, infrastructure, okay? Uh, the call gate means both to enter as well as exit, okay? So you want to do binary inspection. We are coming to that now. Uh, 
uh, and you want to create binaries that do not have this uh, instruction that update the PKRU or register at any other location in the program. And what I will show you is that even if it does exist in a binary, there are ways and means by which you can fix it. Okay. And I will then present you the evaluation of, uh, of uh, Irem. Okay. So there are two ways in which you can update the PKRU register. Uh, one is, of course, you know, the WR PKRU instruction. Uh, the functionality of which is to write whatever is the contents of the 32-bit EAX register into PKRU, right? You can set your domain permissions appropriately, write it in EAX and then copy it to PKRU. That's one way to do it. And the other is the XR store instruction, which is basically, it works like this. If the ninth bit of EAX is set, then it loads the PKRU register from uh, memory address that is specified as an argument to uh, the XR store, okay? So uh, that's the, I mean, they're variants of each other, but pretty much they do the same thing. They load up the PKRU register with a specific value, either from EAX or from a specified memory address. So the point is that, you know, you if you want to modify the PKRU register, which is the way that you set permissions or unset permissions, uh, and therefore, you know, enter the trusted compartment or exit the trusted compartment, uh, the permissions to change the WRPKRU register. Of course, you know, any instruction user space can go and issue it, but, the, but we would like to ensure that in an application binary, that the only place that this WRPKRU instruction happens is at the call gate that we provide that the programmer will then use in order to enter and exit that it does not appear anywhere else in the binary so that we can prevent attackers from misusing these inadvertent occurrences of these instructions. Okay, so this is how you switch safely using call gates, right? Um, I know it sounds like the name of a toothpaste, but uh, when, I, when I say it fast, but, but there you go, right? So here is your untrusted application. You're going to set the permission to this trusted, right? Which is what the paper calls uh, you know, that, uh, uh, you know, uh, enter the trusted area and then the WRPKRU with that permission you're writing and then you're going to the trusted entry point. So whenever you enter the trusted compartment, we assume that there is a fixed entry point to this trusted compartment so that the entry always goes over there. And then from there on, you can probably have a switch case that then uh, uh, changes control flow to the appropriate functionality within the trusted compartment. And the exit, of course, is the same way which is that you set the permission to untrusted and then the WRPKRU is updated. So what you want to avoid is the situation shown in the red arrow where if the untrusted application somehow sets the permission to trusted, right? Which is just setting the value of EAX and then calls WRPKRU directly and then the untrusted application is then able to access the trusted compartment. You would like to avoid situations like this. So the way that we are going to avoid this situation is by ensuring that um, uh, you know we are going to remove the execute permission from uh, injected code pages, right? So pages that uh, contain data are not going to be executable, right? Those are basic um, uh, protections that we will do, that we will uh, uh, deploy. We will also monitor the system calls. Uh, to, for example, ensure that mProtect instructions are not being issued. But more importantly, we will also scan memory pages statically and ensure that the WRPKRU is um, part of a call gate only. And the XR store is always followed by this one specific instruction, which is that EAX is uh, uh, the value is uh, you, the ninth bit is set then you don't want to execute it, right? So yeah, WXR store can appear in other portions of the instructions, but the ninth bit of EAX should not be one at that point. This will ensure that the application, uh, the, the only place it is allowed to be one is if this XR store is part of the call gate, okay? So uh, as long as we are able to ensure that these two rules are satisfied in the rest of the application, uh, then you can prevent attacks. So what kind of attacks are you preventing? Well, you know, code injection attacks, can also introduce WRPKRU instructions. 
So we are going to prevent against code injection attacks very easily by using the WXOR X protection of the underlying operating system. So why are we going through so much pain over here to ensure that these instruction sequences do not appear anywhere else? The reason is because of return-oriented programming, right? Return-oriented programming works despite the WXOR X protection enabled. So if you have return-oriented programming, you, despite having the uh, WXRX protection, the attacker may be able to coerce the application to go and execute its own code for bad purposes. And we are going to try to avoid that by ensuring that these two instructions do not appear anywhere else in the program's address space. Okay, so uh, let us now look at the way that these instructions can be avoided and then we will see how that works. Okay, so the natural question to ask is, you know, uh, if you want to make sure that WRPKRU as well as XR store, these instructions only appear in the call gate as well as the call exits, then is it really the case that these instructions, the, the byte sequences represent these instructions actually appear elsewhere in other binary code, right? Um, so, in order to perform this uh, uh, this analysis, the authors took a whole bunch of ELF files from various distributions of Linux. Uh, this shows the number of files and then did a scan of these ELF binaries to check whether they contain the three byte pattern corresponding to let's say WRTKRU or the byte pattern corresponding to XR store. And they found that 665 files out of these 56,000 files do in fact contain it, okay? Um, and in fact, the number of executable instructions out of these files, there were around 4,200 instructions. I'm just looking at the first column. You can read the other columns similarly. And if you were to look at the WRPKRU or the XR stored instructions and code, there were actually 481 instances out of these 56,000 files. Um, and uh, so they took a disassembler and, dis and identified around 420. And they observed that there were 30 inter instruction and 390 intra instruction appearances of the three byte pattern, which is this EF010F that corresponds to WRPKR. I'm going to go over that in slightly more detail. Okay. So this, this pattern over here, as I said, this three byte pattern represents WRPKRU. So what do we mean by an inter instruction WRPKRU? Well, if you have an instruction that ends with the pattern 0F and another instruction that begins with the pattern 01EF and they are placed next to each other, then if you start reading from the last byte of this first instruction, it ends up reading like the WRP carry instruction. If you go back and, and look at our lecture on return-oriented programming, you note that you can create gadgets from anywhere. Okay, so we don't want this pattern over here like this. That's an inter-instruction appearance. An intra-instruction appearance is if this pattern appears within an existing instruction, because for instance, maybe the instruction is, appear, is taking arguments uh, that end up creating this particular byte pattern. And so the paper contains a number of tricks that allow you to do binary rewriting to uh, eliminate these patterns purely at compile time, um, uh, uh, sorry, at compile time or at runtime or a static binary rewriting approach. And the paper takes the static binary rewriting approach. Okay, so here is the way in which you can perform rewriting. If there are two instructions neighboring next to each other that have this three byte pattern, you insert a no op in between. So now it uh, the code at least looks different. And the, if you were to read from any place, you would not get the WRP carry instruction inadvertently via this inter instruction boundary. Uh, it might be that, you know, there are uh, appearances of this within an instruction, right? If you look at the x86 instruction format, this is roughly how it looks. There's a prefix and there's an op code. There is a, uh, another mod RM uh, uh, set of uh, uh, bits and then immediate as well as displacement, okay? So the required uh, argument, this is the sort of the required portion. These are all optional. This is roughly how an x86 instruction looks. And so, you know, if you were to take add ECX, EBX plus this over here, essentially what the, um, the op code is 0x01 and the uh, uh, register or memory uh, modifier is ECX and that is 0x0f. 
right? The register ECX is this code. The displacement is this, right? Uh, over here, sorry, uh, zero X zero F is for add ECX, the register is EBX. Okay, so that's what that is. So if you were to start reading from here, you do get the three byte pattern and you want to avoid that. Uh, and how do you avoid that? By just rewriting the instruction. So what you do is you push EAX, you move EAX to EBX, okay? Uh, uh, and then what you do, uh, sorry, uh, uh, move EAX to EBX, and then instead of EBX, you use EAX as the instruction operand. Okay, so add ECX is still the same awk code 0x1, but now because EAX is the register, not EBX, instead of 0x0f, you have 0x07, and then you get rid of the pattern. So the, and then you pop EAX. So the paper presents a whole number of such uh, heuristics to go and uh, modify binary code so as to avoid the three byte pattern that, uh, that corresponds to uh, WR PKRU, okay? Uh, so here it is, right? So um, uh, the full set of rewrite rules, if the op code is WR PKRU, insert a privilege check, that's the first rewrite strategy make sure that the WRPKRU is only within the call gate. Uh, if the modifier contains 0x, uh, uh, 0f, like the one that we saw, like add ECX, change the unused register and move the command, right? This is the example that we just saw. Uh, you change EBX to instead use another register. Um, if you have uh, a sequence like this, add EAX to this, Right, uh, again, you see the byte pattern appearing over here. You change it in this particular way. You have a jump instruction again with this. You change it um, to alter the constant that is, uh, that is used, okay? Uh, so that is how you perform the, the change. Uh, essentially, this is rather comprehensive and these are all tricks to go and avoid these occurrences of these patterns over here, right? Uh, this is what they observed. These are all actual observe, observed occurrences of the three byte pattern and they uh, came up with heuristics to modify it. Idea is that you can statically rewrite the code. Okay, so let us look at a use case and then see how it works, right? So what I show you over here is that now you have actually inserted a no-op, which is the hexadecimal code 90 in the middle of this instruction sequence. And so you've made sure that the three byte pattern only appears in the call gate. Okay, so ERIM is implemented as a user space library uh, and the call gates actually contain these occurrences of WRPKRU. They have also implemented a memory allocator that loads the trusted uh, uh, that uh, for the trusted uh, component that overloads this malloc like functions so that uh, any time you go and do a malloc from within the trusted component, the memory is allocated on the uh, pages that are marked trusted, right? The, with the P key value uh, corresponding to the partition or the domain for trusted pages, right? And the memory inspection module that goes and does a static memory in inspection ensures that there are no unsafe occurrences of this WRPKRU or the XR store instruction. Okay, so uh, then you prevent the execution of pages with unsafe uh, WRPKR and XR store. There are a number of ways in which you can do this even at runtime if you wish, right? You can actually use ptrace or you can use what is called the, uh, a BPF user space monitor. BPF stands for Berkeley Packet Filters. So SecComp works together with BPF. It's a lightweight way of going and checking the instructions that are instruction stream of the of the program and ensuring that it's not there. Okay, um, they've also implemented static binary rewriting tool that goes and implements the heuristics that we just described uh, using a tool called Dynast. It's a binary rewriter. Okay, so how do you evaluate a system like this? Uh, well, they inspected about two hundred thousand executable files uh, on five very popular Linux distributions. They found around 1,200 inadvertent uses of this WRPKRU or XR store instructions. Uh, and, you know, Dynast was able to successfully disassemble 1,023 of those binaries. Not all programs can be easily disassembled, but it was able to 
and applying those heuristics, you were able to rewrite it to remove these inadvertent WRPKRU instructions. Okay, so now let's look at the runtime overheads, right? And in order to study the runtime overheads, we will take a case study of this web server called Nginx. Okay, and the goal of the isolation uh, of the experiment is going to be, so Nginx is a web server. Web servers always maintain active session keys for web uh, clients that have got active sessions with them. And so you want to make sure that if a, if a web server is, is compromised, that uh, even if the web server is compromised, not all the session keys go and fall in the hands of the attacker. Next class, actually, we'll be studying a method called privilege separation that examines this problem in more detail. But session keys, in this particular case, I'm providing you a lightweight method of, um, of uh, isolating session keys. Okay. More ex examples are there in the paper, which is a managed runtime, Node.js, you want to isolate it from native libraries, and also protect the in-memory state of reference monitors like um, you know, CFI variants. This is code pointer integrity. Uh, we won't be looking at these two there in the paper. You should read them. They are part of the reading. In this presentation, we'll be looking at one case study. Okay, so the case study over here is that Nginx is using OpenSSL and libcrypto for all sorts of uh, cryptographic applications. For example, when it wants to start HTTPS, uh, do any sort of uh, encryption or decryption, but that AES, which is the uh, uh, symmetric encryption uh, uh, algorithm, it maintains a compartment where keys are maintained. Okay, so, um, and that is protected. Okay, so the idea is that anytime you want to access the AES compartment, you want to be able to switch from these modules into the AES compartment, go and do all of those things there and come out, okay? So if a web server is a very high, typically web servers have very high uh, throughput requirements and web servers, because most web sessions today are HTTPS, you can imagine that crypto is something that they do all the time. Anytime you communicate over HTTPS, you're actually using AES to encrypt the packets, AES on top of RSA. Um, we will study that as well. So over here, you can imagine that Nginx has very high throughput requirements. And therefore, if you have a protected compartment like this, that there'll be lots of switching between the untrusted and the trusted compartments. And what we see over here is a chart depicting the normalized overhead of uh, uh, performing this uh, transition. The details of this experiment are in the paper, uh, but you see that you know the blue bars represent native performance without EDIM protection. If you have EDIM protection, you can see that the performance dips slightly, but it is still within 5% of the native. And this is actually a very, very impressive number um, when you look at the other available methods. The key thing to remember here is that this is in process isolation. So this AES compartment is executing in the same process as the Nginx web server uh, and the open SSL lib crypto libraries are also loaded in the Nginx uh, uh, process address space. So very low overhead. And so the way that this is accomplished of course is because writing to the PKRU register is um, it takes only around 10 to 200 cycles and you have ensured statically that there are no illegal occurrences of these registers uh, of the of the WRPKRU or the XR stored instructions anywhere else in the program. Okay, so in the worst case, you can see that there are 1.3 million switches between the untrusted and trusted domains, and still you only have a 5% overhead. Okay, so if you were to go and look at other techniques and the paper actually, this paper, one of the key aspects of this paper is that it has a very, very, very comprehensive treatment of related work, not just in terms of describing how this work compares to related work, but also in terms of experimentation and empirical evaluation. It's a model paper to live by. Um, and you can see over here that they take various known techniques such as lightweight context, which are uh, another in-process isolation technique, uh, technique called MEMS entry, which builds on top of MPX, not MPK, MPX, if you remember. MPX is nothing but, if you remember from the fat pointers lecture, is the hardware variant of softbound. Uh, VM funk is the uh, virtualization extension uh, and EDIM. 
and the native performance of course is the highest performance that you can achieve as you can see the lowest overhead is imposed by erim in all cases across all cases okay so the summary here is that um, erim prevents um, uh, it it enables the creation of this trusted partitions in the code uh, and switching to and switching out of these trusted partitions using the notion of call gates um, it uses static binary inspection and rewriting to ensure that wrpkru uh, as well as xr store do not appear at any unauthorized locations in the code and we see that the uh, performance of this technique is rather impressive so that concludes this lecture. Uh, if you have any questions, you may feel free to post them on the Teams uh, portal, and I will try my best to answer them in time. Thank you very much.